Welcome, welcome. Hey, everyone. I just got to get rid of this chat window. There we go. I guess we should. It's two o'clock. Let's do this. Hello, everybody. This is Virtuous Con, and we are the storytelling panel. Tonight, we're going to be meeting with extraordinary creators. So let's let's get started. I'm going to be your moderator. My name is Thaddeus House. I am a comic historian, a journalist, and a writer of speculative fiction. But today, I'm going to be introducing you to the beasts who are doing this. These are the names to conjure by. Rodney Barnes, Evan DeCrease. I saw your video. Uh, <laughs> Evan, I saw your video. Uh, okay. Katiti Badaki, I saw your video. You did uh, with uh, Sci-Fi. Very good. Picard forever. Um, <laughs> Daniel, I mean, David, you and I, we've met each other for years, so we're good. Uh, Sebastian, I read, I met, I read your books, and then I met you at a couple of conventions. We sat for hours and hours, and we talked. And so one person I actually don't really know well is Rodney Barnes, though I do know his work. No, it's not personal, brother. I mean, it's, I know your work. You're not you know. missing anything. Your the, the, knows me, though. So the, that's the, all, that's all that matters. Guy. She can speak for me. The, the boondock speaks for you, brother. We all good. We bow down. We are we're, we're not worthy. So you know, thank you so much for for all being here today. And I wanted to talk to you guys because I think the kind of work that you're doing is extraordinary. So let me say that I did see your Philadelphia, sir. Thank you. Oh my God. I, I'm not even. We're gonna just. I just want you to know. I do know that of you. I know your writing, and that was outstanding. Thank you so much. Thank you much. very much. Um. So I want to start today with asking you guys a couple of questions. All of you create things, all of you write things, or in, or involved in the creation of things that are being made. When you're making that work, did you think when you first sat down to that work that you were loving, that you ever had a career for that work beyond the moment? You know, you wrote a thing, you're done, I'm finished with it. Will it transform into anything else? And did you know that when you first did it? I'm curious, anybody, pipe up. Oh that's yeah, a David, that's a that's a David Walker question if I ever heard one. What? Go for it, David. Oh man, <clears throat> no, I never thought I would have it, and and self doubt still keeps me from believing that I do have it, or or keeps me thinking that I'm going to get caught. Like some uh, any minute the the um the the whatever the police that uh, keep track of people who are faking it and 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 imposters are going to find me and 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 realize, yo man, you just you got away with it one too many times. So, uh, but no, I never thought I, I would be here. Um, but at the same time, this is very clear. I, I never had any idea of anywhere else I could be. So it was like, I'm, I'm going to this place, but I never actually thought I would make it. But I, I never, I've never had a plan B. It was always like, yeah, I guess I'm, I got to jump out of the airplane. I don't have a parachute. Oh, well, we'll see what happens. Fair enough. What about you, uh, Nucris? Because I know you, when you were working in doing the Mar you were talking about the Marvel thing like it was completely unexpected. So t tell <laughs> yeah, me. It was, um, you know, uh, my career is in journalism. I'm, or rather, I should say my writing career started in journalism, right? <laughs> I was a reporter and a critic, you know, writing about uh, pop culture and all this, the stuff I love. So. You know, I thought that was going to be my path moving forward. I thought it was going to be, okay, you're going to keep on talking about the stuff that other people are making. But, you know, um, when when an editor at Marvel reached out to me to write The Rise of the Black Panther, you know, a bunch of other uh, creative entities did the same thing. They're like, oh, you want to do this too? And um, so I wound up working in animation and, and uh, video games and a, a bunch of other stuff and more comics. So I never thought, you know, this is where I was uh, ultimately going to wind up. And like David, you know, I struggle with the the notion that some uh, authoritarian body somewhere is going to uh, swoop in and pluck me back out. Um, sure, uh, uh, a little bit, a <laughs> little bit. But, you know, I think um, the thing that keeps me going is, you know, the, a lot of the same tools I use as a critic and a reporter are what I use as a writer, right? Like, what are the stories to be told here? You know, what are the things that are underneath the surface that um, I can share with people and and hopefully um, enrich their lives and, and, and broaden their understanding of the world? So, you know, uh, when I do start to doubt myself, I'm like, you know what, you have 
the instincts that brought you here. And kind of, again, to echo David again, it's like, I kind of have nowhere else to be, you know, like I'm, I, I don't have an HVAC, you know, uh, a licensed degree that I can go um, and fall back on. Let's not, don't laugh. Those, those people make oh, money. Oh, no, brother. I'm not laughing. I'm serious. I, I'm with you. I feel you. Yeah. So, you know, I feel like it's either this or bust, you know, like I, 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 I got to do this or else um, it's, it's uh, time to figure out something else. Sebastian, I know your story, but you, you might want to share it with the rest of us. I know when you started, you've been thinking about this thing your whole life, so. Yeah, yeah, I had um, no reservation. I knew this was exactly it. I had it planned out from when I was 13. I was like, I'm going to become a comic writer, make lots of money selling comics. That might have been the one thing that I had slightly wrong back then, you know, make lots of money selling comics. Um, but no, I mean, just... Um, I think, I think from from the early days of I essentially wanting to create stories, playing a lot of Dungeons and Dragons and live action role playing, that was my that, that was my that. Um, But it, it really was, um, I think, a cathartic release of how to pour my vulnerabilities on, you know, onto paper, and if I could pour things onto paper that reflected my vulnerabilities and my ambitions, my wrath and all these various things um, into the stories that I was creating, then um, the, the, the characters then some took on a life of their own, I guess. And, and the characters I was trying to create were trying to make this fictitious world I was creating a better place. And so as I grew, the characters grew with me. Um, but I discovered I came into kind of the writing later on in life, funnily enough, as far as a career, um, after running a record label for a lot of years. And I, I really enjoyed writing the liner notes for the albums. And so while I was playing a lot of D&D &D and live action role playing in my mom's bathrobe, I was, uh, I was uh, running a record label. So, so essentially when I round, wound the record label down, I, I shopped around these ideas to different comic companies and a lot of it was, it felt like they saw the creations of a, oh, that looks like a good Black History Month announcement. <laughs> and it felt very hollow and very vapid. So I was like, all right, bet. I guess I got to start another company to protect the integrity of these characters that hopefully will um, resonate on authentic soul levels in addition to representation, but story, story, story as well. Anyway, I'll shut up. If that's my... Uh, that's my journey. I don't remember the question, but yeah, I've been at it for a bit. <laughs> no, yeah, you you got you got there, uh, Ms. Badaki. Can you share a little bit about your exploration? Oh, well, this this journey is uh, continuously surprising. Um, where where you find yourself, um, the places you find yourself, and hey, Rodney, Evan, good to see you all, mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, good to to meet all of you as well. Um, and so even to now that right now I'm in Greece at like, you know, midnight, um, having this conversation, if you told me this was going to be happening, I would have said, you know, that that's absolutely impossible. Um, and also in creating things, and there are things that are happening now that hopefully soon I can talk about more soon because I'm dying to. Um, but the, the fact that um, I always knew I loved story, I always knew I wanted to be a part of storytelling. My in was yes, as as an actor, um, as and telling stories that way. But um, what surprised me and um, has given so much more joy and um, has added even more depth is is the many different approaches that I'm finally able to be a part of in in telling a story. Um, and so, I mean, the short answer is yes, it's surprising, but at the same time, it's surprising. And I love that everybody spoke about, you know, looking out for that um, authoritarian mm -hmm. <laughs> entity that's going to come in and say, wait a minute, how did Yatide sneak in here with all these people, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so I'm glad I'm not the only one that feels that. But all through it, even though there is a lot of surprise and joy and all of that, there is also a um, is at the same time a strange kind of certainty that, well, this was a necessity to some extent, that it, um, this part had to occur because 
as you know, Sebastian has spoken to, as everybody speaks to uh, in regards to representation, it almost feels that whatever part you're taking on within the storytelling space, um, as someone that has been historically underrepresented, there's often uh, the, the, the need and the push to continue to move the needle forward with everything that's going on. Uh, so I love that I answered it. I said short answer and then gave you like a 20 minute. Uh... No, 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 you only used two minutes and you were excellent at it. Not even a question here. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you. Mr. Barnes. Yeah, um, the same as everybody else. Uh, I'm still afraid that at some point someone's going to come and tell me I don't belong here and I've got to go back to Walmart or Kmart or any of the other marts I used to work at uh, growing up or security or the myriad of other jobs that I had to um, endure on my journey here. So I don't think I've gotten to a point where I'm just like, ooh, I've made it. I'm comfortable now. Um, you know, I'm happy I'm here. I'm happy I'm doing what I'm doing, but there's never, I haven't gotten to a place yet where, whoo, I'm here and, you know, it couldn't go away tomorrow. So bless, happy, grateful. Hope it keeps going. That's that's excellent. I'm glad to hear that you were all frosty. You know, our world being what it is, we should all stay frosty. You know, yeah, I like what I'm doing. I'm good at it, but uh, we keep an eye out just in case. Hey, that's real talk. We we all know this. We, we all know this. Happy Juneteenth, everybody. I mean, well, you've got representation you now. you got to nice keep it frosty because... Like I'm looking at everybody else on the panel, right? And it, it's like, well, it's the Highlander syndrome, right? There can be more than <laughs> one. So it's like, I'm constantly looking in my rear view mirror, seeing, oh, yo, where's Barnes at? And then, uh oh, Evan's creeping up on my left. It's almost like uh, Death Race 2000 or something. And you know, it's only a matter of time before you get eliminated. And, and, um, no, it's, you know, what's, I just have to say, because it's fascinating because, I, I, whenever I see somebody's doing something new, there's this part of me that's like, man, I wish that was me. And mm -hmm. then I'm like, I'm so glad it's not me because <laughs> if it was me, I would feel like I'm the only one. And you, you, as your career moves forward, there's a lot of times you feel that isolated feeling of, um, you know, just like, like you're, you're carrying too much of, uh, people put a lot of, of, of meaning into you know things like diversity representation, and and it sometimes can feel like you're carrying the burden alone. So um, yeah. I'm hoping the rest of you have that herniated feeling <laughs> that I sometimes get. Well, oh, see, it's now, the worst. Hey, well, hold on. So David, you you brought it up. So now I don't feel so bad about it. Now I saw your video, Evan, and you talked about you know there's only one, there's only one in a in a movie, one black person in a movie. He has to do all the heavy lifting. He must carry yeah. the whole story because he's alone. And I, I thought about that and, and I realized that's exactly how we all feel. We're all out here doing this pretty much feeling alone. And so when you talked about that, I was like, I need to know more. Tell me, give me some more on that. Because I know I mean, you know you what know, I'm talking about. Yeah, it, it's, it's been a hallmark of my career, unfortunately, you know, where, you know, a lot of times, whether I was working in, in journalism or, or on the creative side of things, you know, I'm still the only person in the room. You know, I've had the good fortune on a few projects I've worked on where I've, there's been more than one black person, more than one person from a marginalized group in a room. And let me tell you something, it changes a lot. You know, it changes so much uh, where you feel like, David said, you're not carrying that, that burden of, you know, where you gotta be credit to your race, you know, to use the old time phrase of, um, um, by yourself, you know, like it's, 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 it's a huge burden. Um, it, it, you know, it, it jams you up creatively because then you're worrying about, okay, am I, am I, do I have the full freedom to like portray like a, 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 a big broad swath of humanity through these characters or do I have to play it safe, you know? And, you know, uh, if you're empowered by the people that you're partnering with, when, when it's a situation you have to partner with people, you, you, those, those considerations can fall away. But, you know, I feel like if, if you're a black person of, uh, I, I'll just say it of a certain age, you just, you know, grew up seeing us being underrepresented. So when you have the chance to help shape those stories, you, you take that responsibility very seriously. And, you know, I, I work in a lot of, you know, I, I'm doing a lot of video game work right now, which means I'm helping out narrative design and shaping characters and stories and stuff. And um, 
you know, the, the number of black video game developers is 2%. You know, it's, this is a, this is a uh, population of, of an industry that, that goes into the thousands, you know, and 2% two, 2 is a represent, reprehensible number. You know, it's, it's absolutely awful. So, you know, like David said, like, yeah, like, I, I, I'm trying to stick it out in a lot of ways just so I can open doors for other people to follow, you know, like I have a comic book coming out. Um, um, I didn't need a co-writer, but I bought an, uh, 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 a writer who I admired um, to bring, be my co-writer. So now he has a credit on his name. And, you know, he's a guy I love and trust. So we had a great time working on it together. Um, but, you know, like that was a conscious choice for me to be like, OK, let me move Austin along a little bit. Let me do what I can to, to, to move Austin along a little bit. Um, and, and I was happy to do that, but, um, it was also like self-preservation, like, so I don't burn the hell out in two years. <laughs> uh, um, and, and he'll, he'll have my back, hopefully. Rodney, now I saw your Philadelphia mm -hmm. and I noticed there's a lot of black people in that, in that series. I'm yeah. sure that wasn't a mistake. No, we, we all over there. We, we, it's a bunch of us. Um, yeah, I mean, I grew up watching a lot of hammer films and universal monster films and very that's rarely saw like that's what yeah. it felt I knew, I knew it was a familiar feeling yeah it was very rarely did i see us and if it was one of us it was the dude that was scared and shaking in the closet um it was never <laughs> yeah exactly him yes yes <laughs> oh, Lord, is it? look at his teeth yeah and uh i was like if i ever had the opportunity and this was as a kid if I ever had the opportunity to uh, take a crack at writing stories like this, I would do it the way, you know, I would make it feel the way that I wanted it to feel. Um, you know, to something that David said uh, earlier about feeling like the only one, I, in screenwriting, certainly, um, your Tia and I could probably share some stories, you know, mm -hmm. of, uh, you know, when, when you're the only one and you have to represent, you feel like you have to represent the entire culture to a group of people outside of the culture. It's difficult. You know, the first thing that crosses my mind is like, we live in the same world. How can y'all know so little of us? You know, it's it's like- And we know so much of your world. Yeah, it's, it's always amazing. But in the realm of comics, it's a little bit different. It's a little bit more intimate. It's like when I see Bitterroot doing so well or Naomi or any of the books, that I appreciate. It's like a rising tide lifts all boats. I'm as enthusiastic about getting those books as I am getting my own because it, ser it sets a standard. It's not just about the, the diversity or the ethnicity. It's the craft that's there. Yeah. And to me, being able to see stories that are well crafted, it, it it's not just about representation. It's also motivating creators that are coming behind us to really take their craft seriously and um, put their hearts into it. So I dig it all. You see that? Oh, yeah, you know I'm coming to you. Representation, girl. Let's see. <laughs> uh, American Gods. Uh, let's see. Orlando. Uh, I mean, come on now. T talk about it. Let, let me yeah, you see that. Tell them. Tell them. <laughs> That's right. Come on now. Here's your chance. I'm going to sit back That's and right. for myself. <laughs> all hands. Hold on. Brace for impact. <laughs> All right, don't make don't don't make her angry. You know what's gonna happen if she, well, that's if she true. gets angry. That's very, very true. <laughs> I love that I just kind of morphed into the Hulk a little bit there. I'll, I'll take it. Um no, it's uh, I mean everything that's already been said is you know that has has spoken to all of this so poignantly. Um for one thing, you know, you, you really start to notice on sets when um like Evan mentioned when it's it's a, it's, a, it's additional, almost additional work that you do, right? That you, when you are able to see others who are completely unencumbered by what their representation may do for their whole, for a whole group, they're able to just go in and explore without anything, um, you know, without having to think about every single moment and how that might reflect. And there's, you know, there's, Yes, there's a moment when you watch that and you go, oh, you know, I, I wish I knew what that felt like um, because my entire existence uh, on, on screen or in any way creatively has always been informed by, by um, understanding that I often end up representing um, a, a large group of people who somehow end up not having as large a representation on screen. Um, 
so I mean, it, it's it's continuously, um, and again, like Evan said, this continuously part of the reason why I'm also always trying to open doors the same way that that you speak of, always trying to make sure that, um, like Rodney said, boy, uh, all the boats are rising, um, trying to also, and uh, finding a lot of times that. Um, whether I understood it in the earlier years or not, that I also then needed to be making sure to um, speak for especially the, the newer, younger individuals coming in, for especially about the things that they, they don't realize may be out there, um, or the things that they don't realize that they, they need to or should ask for. Because mm -hmm. I look back at where I started and I didn't know those things um and i was very hair, lucky. Hair and makeup. what's that hair and makeup oh my goodness oh, mm, don't get me started my wife is in the back room you it's still an issue it's still an issue it's so funny because because you know, i like when you're working in comics and you're trying to talk mm -hmm. to an artist it's like all right let me see how you draw black people like mm -hmm. do they and, and it mm -hmm. i've had fights with editors about this you know and and just make sure you draw some of us in the background and while you're at it throw some women in throw some asian folks maybe you know whatever like yeah yeah yeah, yeah. right right but, but you know but back to your point you see that about the things you don't even know to ask for when you're starting out yeah right right and uh, you brought up hair and makeup and, and i say thank you because right now i'm like i don't know the last time i had like just cornrows and all of that that's because we have this incredible we have an incredible team here um we have these you know these wonderful black women <laughs> that have taught me so much about my hair. Um, the weave came out for the first time in I don't know how long. And that was wow. because people didn't understand that, you know, the weave was in there so that I could have a certain level of control because I didn't in so many spaces. And I would walk into a space and talk about tears, talk about all those things where you go in, you know, first off, it's a water-based thing that's going in and you're like, you know, that's going to mess up, but you know, um, and so I then had to adopt the weave to make sure I had control mm -hmm. when I went into those spaces because I knew at least then people knew how to curl that, iron that, do whatever with it. And, you know, it was a protective mechanism. And so that was actually, it might sound like a small thing, but it was a huge moment this year when, you know, and you see me posting pictures of my fro and all of that. That's all thanks to these incredible women mm -hmm. here. Um, and which actually started with, and I should say, the, the incredible woman that we had in my last season of American Gods, who, you know, first started me on the journey of going natural. Um, but that's a that's a huge element. Um, and that's something that someone coming in doesn't feel comfortable asking uh, for. And, and even the time that goes with it, about how much time is needed and all of that. I didn't mean to make this a whole spiel. No, no, no. This is exactly why you needed to be here. When when people were asking me, well, where are the women on this panel? I'm like, oh, oh. I have no control over that. I just moderate. And so I knew we had to have one. And when your name came to us, I was like, yes, thank you, God. Because I knew that there were going to be things that only you were going to be able to talk about. I mean, look at David Walker. When's the last time he had any hair? I'm not, I'm not even taking my thing off. I don't have no hair. I got nothing to say about it. So don't just stop, Sebastian. Yes, you and your your perfect hair. I know so all get about out of bed, look. So get out of bed, Don't worry. Look for the best, you know. D don't, don't worry. I'm coming for you now, sir, because I have a question for you. How is it your main characters are all brown people, sir? How is it? Say that again, mate. How are all your characters brown people, sir? Why, why are you asking me that specific question, Thaddeus? Because in a world like the one we live in today, you are a white creator making brown characters. Yes, last time I checked. You're about to learn. You're about to get checked. Oh, okay. Well, school me. It's school me. I, I, don't really, I don't really care. I, I feel like some of the time I look like a Turkish vampire. So, you know. <laughs> okay, I'll buy that. You know, I'll buy that. Actually, Turkish with the hair, that actually Turkish works kind of well. You know, I just I just hope for the best, mate. You know, it's very funny actually being mixed. You kind of get different different people's perceptions of of uh, of me. Like, there's been a time where I've literally walked down the street and some blokes like Shabbat Shalom. I'm like, oh hello. And 30 <laughs> seconds later, it's like Assalamu Alaikum. I'm like, hello. 
Yeah. Hello. So, so it's just a one. It's a, it's a it's it's a crazy thing. So the reason uh, I guess ninety uh, percent of my characters are uh, uh, brown brown folks is being a very growing up in a very small country villagey type setting in England. Um, I really f there's a you know forty seven now. So back then, experiencing boarding house, a lot of uh, bullying and so on, and a lot of racism and. Folks, a lot of times that were in the boarding house who were brown or if they had a Northern English accent or whatever the case may be, they'd either try to run uh, or commit suicide. Uh, it was a pretty, you know, it was a pretty hefty time. So as a young lad, I kind of, I think, found these realities of you're either, you, you either have fight or flight, right? Um, and you know, I was too afraid of my dad to not be a fighter. So in the real world, I was a fighter, but my flight was fantasy. And I believe the character of Niobe that I'd created back as a little guy was again this this character, this being who was also mixed like me, but but definitely inherently black and wanting <coughs> to, bless you, wanting to find ways to connect with her tribe, connect with her roots, connect with her ancestors. Which I also found it didn't matter what background you were from, it was this thing where you can find places and pockets that you can fit in, but where do you belong? Are there places or is it people that you belong? And, and so on. So if you're a fringe person, you know, you're on the fringe or this, whatever the case may be, or teenagers are like, I'm so irreverent, don't talk to me. Can you tell I'm irreverent? Can you tell? You know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, found, I found that that was very much this reality for Niobe, who became this character who would go through the, these these journeys. And then after winding down the record label, um, I uh, and I was starting Stranger Comics, and I had these ca characters and so on. I was going around for different investors to say, hey, look, I'm going to start this company. And folks were like, oh, you know, um, there's not enough black people that read comics and your, your, your main heroes are black. There's not enough of them for me to risk investing. Oh, your lead hero is a woman. There's not enough women. Oh, and people don't read fantasy comics. They just, they come and they go for the most part. And I'm like, yeah, I'm going to do all free, you know? So I just did it all essentially, um, you know, on, on, the, on my credit card as it were. And what we didn't know at the time, and some of you guys might correct me, but, I partnered with, because I might be mixed, but I'm not a young black girl, strangely enough. I, I created this character, Niobe, who I introduced in various stories. But when we did Niobe Shears Life, I was like, I have to have a young black girl speak on her behalf. And we partnered with this actress, Amanda Stenberg, and she wrote, and they found this artist, Ashley A. Woods, and she did the art. And it was the first nationally distributed comic in history with a black female author, artist, and hero. And so suddenly we had all this this worldwide press and all this kind of craziness, and and everyone's like, oh, it's so timely. And I and I was always saying, but it's always been timely. And why are you trying to create something timely? Surely you want to create something timeless. Mm -hmm. So it's always going to stand this test of time, no matter what era you put forth your work. And you're not doing it for a hashtag that's trending. You'll do it because it needs to be done. And it also has a resonant weight within within yourself as well. So uh, to answer your question, yeah, the diversity and inclusion is literally my life <laughs> since the beginning. Um, met many a many an intriguing punch up has uh, come along the way, and uh, now it's a lot easier writing comics. And and I'm finding, and to echo what David was saying too, it is incredible. And especially with the perception of who I might be and where I might come from, which I totally understand. I get out. I really don't care. But the, the, the responsibility and the weight when you have grandparents bring their grandkids to the conventions and they grip you and say, don't give up, young man. You're, 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 the ancestors are speaking through you and, 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 and so on and so forth. And, uh, you're doing lectures and you're saying, I, I dropped kind of out of school at 17. I, I didn't go to college and I don't know what the hell I'm doing. All I knew is I had a story to tell and multiple stories to tell. <coughs> Bless you. And that, and that really, when they, when you have the grandparents saying that with, with the tears and it's all these emotional moments you have over the years. And sometimes you, and I'm sure David, you, a lot of you guys can relate. Like sometimes you want to pack it up and go and pick peaches on a peach farm. 
and that's it. Like, peace out. No more Instagram. No more nothing. No more hoofing boxes to conventions. No Dude, I, I, I watch your deals. You know, I, I watch your Instagram. You are masterful. You work that crowd like you're a magician. You're just doing your Instagram video. I watched you. Was it last night or the night before? One of them just recently. Every week, every week. Yeah, watch I, I watched you. You you work that crowd. They they know you. You know them. You have a connection. It is it is a thing to see. I I was Thanks. always impressed by that. So, Thanks. I appreciate uh, it. Mr. Barnes, I, I have a question for you, sir. You've been doing this a very long time. How do you keep it fresh? How do you when you say you this, this, this creating this, oh, creating um, stuff, producing stuff, envisioning new stuff? I mean, how do you keep it fresh? Why aren't you picking peaches on a peach farm somewhere? Oh, uh, my bad hips, bad knees. <laughs> <laughs> I was too tired to pick much of anything at this point. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I, kind of like what I said earlier, I never envisioned being in a position where anyone would pay me to write a story in the first place. So every day is, is sort of a gift um, to be able to, to walk into a studio and write television and film and someone's willing to give me some money to, to, to do this. You know, that's sort of it. I mean, I would do it for free anyway. In regards to comics, it's really just the love of having loved comics my entire life. Uh, you don't do it to get rich. Um, you know, sure don't. Thing about being able to create original IP, which is great. But a lot of the stories and books that have come and are coming from me are really ideas that I tried to sell as TV shows or movies and studios just weren't biting. And um, I wanted to get the story out of my system. So this was a great mm -hmm. way of being able to just to get it out there and hopefully people would respond. But um, it's intrinsic. It's all just a love of the medium, um, being part of a community that I always wanted to be a part of, and um, it's all from the heart. Rodney, you said you'd um, you'd do it for free. Uh, can mm -hmm. I get your email address? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was gonna say, don't do that. Don't do that. As a as a publisher, you know, I'm a big fan. You know, <laughs> the out in I want to, I'm damn you're doing it for free for a couple of people right now. So yeah, um, I got, I got to chime in something about what Come on, David. you just said, though, and and I it's it's really fascinating, and and this is more for anybody who's listening as opposed to us as as individuals and panelists. Um, you know, you, you, Rodney keeps talking about the craft of comics, mm -hmm. right? The medium of comics. And, and taking, in some cases, taking properties that were meant for another medium. What I appreciate about your work, though, is that it doesn't read like, you know, no. you, oh. you're not going into it. Even if you're taking, oh, well, what am I going to do with this this TV pilot that didn't sell? Yeah. It's you've, you've translated it into this specific medium that of comics, which so many people don't get. Right. It's different yeah. than TV. It's different than it film. Yeah. And you can't it just... Is. You just no. can't take this square peg, yes. put it in a round hole, and find success. And 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 so I appreciate that. I appreciate the fact that that you were, you know, at least in my, to my ears, were differentiating. Um, because I, you know, I, I've got a bunch of screenplays that I'm sitting on that it's like they're never going to get turned in to comics. It's just the the work is too much. It's just, it's mm -hmm. just not worth it. Yeah, I, I think for me, it's what's under the story. Like mm -hmm. to your point. It's a different thing, TV, film, and comics. But you know, one. Well, <laughs> Man, I did a I did a panel recently where like none of us the video was working and it basically turned into a podcast. I'm like, I would have just <laughs> been stayed in my pajamas. <laughs> I like um, your shirt, Evan. Are we back? Uh, my set. Uh, I think we were back on. Uh, thanks, Sebastian. Oh, my shirt. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, all right, folks, uh, to our viewers out there, um, we're having a little bit of technical difficulty, so we're going to be self-moderating here, which means the gloves are off. I'm about to tell David how jealous I am of, of Naomi uh, uh, and everything else. Uh, but we were kind of talking about career development, and Rodney was talking about um, how, uh, you know, the disciplines of each specific medium that he writes in, and that's, that's uh, TV writing, episodic TV writing, uh, film screenplays, comic books, um, all have different demands. And, you know, like I consider myself a journeyman still. I'm still, on my, I'm still figuring out how to do all this stuff. But, you know, I, I would like to ask everybody about the different criteria for telling stories 
in different ways. Utida, you've been an actress. Most of us know you from being in front of the camera, but I, I know from having talked to you that you're also going into producing and screenwriting as well. Talk to me about the different parts of your brain that you use to tell stories on the page versus in, in front of the camera. Uh, huh. I mean, that's a great question. And I'm, I love that I'm sitting here with these, all these incredible um, creators and, and you came to me first, Evan, I, I see you. Um, <laughs> we, we can't do what you do. Nobody wants to see us. I know I can. The I, I know I tried. I tried so hard yeah, to do what you do. So yeah. No, no, but it. it I mean, I. I will say I'll use the term journeyman as well. Um. I. What. What I learned. Um. A, a lot of it was. Uh. Was. Was. As Rodney would tell you, a lot of shadowing, a lot of asking people a lot of questions. I'm pretty sure people were tired of me at some point because, um, <laughs> but I always just wanted to know. So what are you doing? How do you do it? What are you know? What uh, what are the things that you run into? And so the different parts of the brain. I mean, I'm I'm that. Um, I, I'd say that weird actor that I can watch a performance and go, and you know what she's doing. That's that's interesting. And I'd like to see her do this maybe next time. And um, the same uh, in some ways when, when I'm writing, um, there is, um, for one, I actually find a lot more freedom there. Um, I, there's definitely a lot more control than uh, coming on as an actor uh, on, on, on a set. Um, but I'm also finding that uh, they do, they inform each other um, because I hear the different characters very much the same way as I hear the different characters um, on, on a set, um, on screen. And in the way that I know that two different actors can come in and bring different feels to it, um, as the voices speak, I know that they can mm. evolve in very different ways as, as they, they move on. I think that gives me a lot of freedom with uh, the way that the characters develop while I'm while I'm writing. Um, the, but the one thing, the commonality is that um, I, I still find the same passion for every single piece that I do. And, and because it's that same passion for storytelling in general. Um, and even when people ask me about my origin story, it always goes back to Oh, I fell in love with stories. Mm. You know, it wasn't that it wasn't that. Oh, I fell in love with that the idea of being an actor or the idea of being a writer or the idea of being a producer. I fell in love with stories um, from the get go. And now, what's been wonderful is being able to explore and grow in each and every direction. And I still have yet a lot to learn from everybody on this panel <laughs> and all the work that I see that's happening out there. Um, but that's the exciting part uh, uh, about it is this, this growth, this feeling like um, being able to stretch, not, not feeling so confined to one idea, to one, any one thing. If um, that you yeah, but I'm going to ask you to expound a little bit because you produced a film last year. I think this was the same project. Last time I saw you in person was on set season two and you were yeah. just beginning to ramp up. So mm -hmm. this this is the Alice in Wonderland uh, adaptation, right? Rather yes. the the riff, the ho Alice in Hollywood riff. Talk about uh, in Hollywood. Land, yeah, yeah. In, in, in talk about conceptualizing that and executing it. Yeah, I mean, that that was another one you there had been the question about whether or not, um, you know, we thought things that we created would be shared. And um, that was one that I wrote um, as 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 a frustrated woman in the industry. Um, and it was, you know, for me, it was a way of processing this world that that we exist in and that can be so confining and can be so um, <laughs> so unwilling to open up space for, again, historically underrepresented groups. And so that it, at the time was a private expression of that. That was the place where I could put it all. And um, I had, you know, had I've been having an interest in, in creating further, doing more things. I really wanted to work on a short first to um, uh, look at the other side of the camera in a sort of microcosm um, before jumping onto other projects. 
And um, I had this wonderful director friend, Jessica Sharif, who read it and she went, but this is the one, you know, mm. start with, this is it. And it, it had that effect with every person then that it was passed on to, went to Karen David, who, as you know, in Fear the Walking Dead, and she said, I want to be in this and I want to produce this, you know, as well. And so it kind of had that snowball effect. And this thing that I had written as a very private um, expression um, before I knew it, you know, we would raise the funds and we, we were we were creating that and creating it while I was doing, yes, uh, that season of American Gods. And also This Is Us at the same time. So yes, uh, that's right. my brain was fried during that time period, I tell you. Um, but it, it was an incredible experience. I learned so much on it. Then there was so much that I was then able to move forward on in, in other directions as well. Um, and, uh, yeah, in Hollywood land in many ways is my, my baby in, in, in that way. That was my, my first public foray, uh, on the other side of the camera. Well, I hope you got more going on in the background. My next question is for, uh, David and Rodney. Um, you, you both have worked, uh, have, have produced work where you invoke history very explicitly. David, obviously you've written graphic novels on Frederick Douglass and the Black Panther Party. Um, but you've also done it in your fiction too. Uh, Rodney, of course, your, your standout episode of American Gods um, was very much about the kind of like systemic injustice that black people face within the United States. How do you, so my question is, you know, how do you avoid invoking history in such a way that it feels like you're making the audience eat their vegetables, you know, take their vitamins. Like, how do you make it still feel like alive and personal um, so that they're not necessarily turned off by um, the historical remove? Uh, David, you start. Man, no, Rodney should start. Um, <laughs> I, You know, that's, a, that's such a great question. The, it, it's, um, <clears throat> well, first and foremost, it's all about making sure that, that your story comes first, right? That that you're not beating your audience over the head with it. That you're entertaining them first, and and so it, it like Bruce Lee said in Enter the Dragon, it's like the art of fighting without fighting, right? And and so you never want to have a scene where your um where your protagonist says, you know, well the Tulsa race massacre happened in 1921, and da -da -da -da, you know, but instead you have them say something like. You know, my grandfather used to always tell me about what it was like growing up after the Tulsa race massacre. Mm -hmm. And then you work it and you find a way to work it in organically. The, the, the thing is, is here, like here in America, when we talk about quote unquote black history, um, we'll just use that as an example or, or women's history. We talk about it as if it's this compartmentalized thing that can be right. removed out mm -hmm. of the, the larger tapestry of history. Well, that's not true. Um, but so many of the stories within, say, Black history, as an example, have not been told properly that they, like, you can put something in, and most people think you've made it up anyway, right? I mean, when, in, in Bitter Root, when we were talking about the Tulsa Race Massacre, which was right around the time HBO had it in Watchmen, like, nobody believed that that was real, right? right. And so you, and, and this will sound almost flippant, but it's like, you you have that benefit if you're dealing with anything that has to do with outside of white heterosexual land owning men right it sounds like you've made it up because people are like what huh you know so um and, and i love i love doing research i love getting lost in that world and discovering things and thinking is there a way i can work this into a story and you just sort of keep notes and you keep it around and you know it's 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 um for me, history is is, um, you know, it's like a it's like a snack cabinet that never runs out. There's always something in there. Roddy, what about you? Yeah, I tried to um, allow the characters to uh, whatever the historical thing is I'm dealing with. I, I like to let the characters um, say how they feel about it uh, more so than me pontificate about how I feel about it. Um, in Philadelphia, there's a character, uh, Jupiter, who was Thomas Jefferson's um, slave friend growing up. And, uh, you know, I found out about this character when I was in like the fourth friend. grade. Yes. And that Thomas Jefferson, um, that was his task. Well, Jupiter's task in life was to be Thomas Jefferson's best friend. Mm -hmm. And Thomas Jefferson never really loved him, dogged him through life. But this guy was incredibly loyal 
to him throughout the course of his life. And I always wondered in the back of his mind um, how that made him feel. You know, were there ever moments where, you know, he felt like he got a raw deal? And so I inserted that character into Philadelphia in a way that if he had immortality, what would the trauma of having been in that situation, how would it manifest itself over time? Mm -hmm. And more often than not, I think anger uh, would be under it because he deserved a better life. But the way America worked, that wasn't going to happen. And so anytime I can play with history in such a way that um, it's not conventional, um, I can genre bend a little bit to sort of uh, play with my own goals in regards to getting people to pay attention um, to that. I think, uh, as David uh, said, Watchmen, I thought did a really great job and Bitterroot did as well, of just being able to take these things that I'd heard about my entire life, these events, and placing them in such a way that uh, people who were completely unaware that these things happened now at the very least have to ask that question, did that really happen? And hopefully find out for themselves. I, I, had, oh. I, had a quick, I had a quick question to throw at you guys. Um, when you're, in just to echo on something we talked about earlier, when you're talking about the burden of responsibility, when you're creating, and I know some of you guys, you know, done a lot of different genres and a lot of different things. Um, and you, do you ever feel essentially about the, the bad pitch is typecast? So mm -hmm. we're very known at my company for doing fantasy you know, right. um, our fantasy stuff. And when I did a comedy, a very kind of a raunchy kind of naughty comedy with a very British voice for Ruining Christmas, I had a lot of folks that were like, oh, I'm not going to back that. That doesn't sit with my morals or whatever the case may be. But when you do Niobe again, I'm all over it. And because on the surface, it seems very raunchy and irreverent, they didn't give it the opportunity to then see the layers of the heart of the story that that I was hope, hopefully like, you know, you, you bring them in with something big and flashy and then they go, oh, my, here's the story. Oh, there's depth. And here's the spirit of, of what the piece is. And we we lost about a thousand followers on Instagram in a month. And um, one lady said, I would never follow a man like you. You must have bought your followers or something. It was, it was, it was wonderful. So my wow. question is, when you, when, when you're, do you ever feel it's, while you're creating these characters, the extra burden of staying in the lane at the at the risk of, you know, oh, I could lose them or oh, they now they now see the other side of me. Like I do like sex and sandwiches. Do I have to be just the dude that's putting weight has, has a fro and has sage and you know, and that and that's it. You know what I'm saying? Like, are you allowed to be a three dimensional storyteller? So um I'll throw that to Evan as you've been asking questions. I mean, it's, a lot of it depends on the gig, you know, like work fire stuff with legacy characters. No, no gig. You create inherently for you. You're not oh, yeah, no. Yeah. I, I don't know any other way to be than as, as, as dimensional as I can be, you know, like, um, you know, I wrote a line in the script recently for like a, a, a big two publisher that kind of had like a little bit of like, <clears throat> libido to it you know and i was like is this gonna get through and and it, it went through and i was like okay um i guess i can do this you know but like to not even attempt it to deny that dimensionality that you're talking about like feels like being dishonest to myself and that's not what i'm into that's not why i got into writing you know like for better or worse you know all the flaws and foibles um and hopefully the strengths you know of myself as a person are gonna find their way out in the work you know and like yeah, there's there's room to grow, obviously, but like, yeah, you know, I, I was, uh, I did an interview recently and somebody asked me like, what do you think is your purpose, your journey, et cetera? And for me, it's always like uh, to try and manifest as full a representation of black humanity as I can, you know, like like within my power, like, and there's a lot of experiences of black humanity that, that I'm not qualified to represent. But like I said, if I can open those doors um, or at least, you know, let people know that, that that it exists. That's what it is. So, like, you know, full dimensionality is always the goal. Um, 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 and you know, don't work with people who don't let you do that. If you have that decision, you always you don't always have that decision. But like, when you when you do, like, yeah. 
I, I agree with everything, everything Evan else, said. You know, um, <clears throat> I kind of look at it this way. Maybe it's maybe part of it's my age, in that I'm I've, I'm just old enough to really not care anymore. Right. right? Like if I if I never work for Marvel or DC again, and and at this point, let's be honest, I'll probably never work for Marvel again. I'm not going to lose any sleep. And if some people I don't know on Twitter don't like me because of something I said in something that they're never going to read or that they didn't buy, they didn't put any money in my pocket, I don't care, right? It's it's <clears throat> going back to some of the stuff you talked about, Sebastian. I, I grew up on the outside looking in. Right. I grew up alienated and and not when I didn't even know what that word was or what it mm. meant. And you know. <laughs> When we talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion, I, I, I did a keynote address recently, and I said, "Look, I didn't I didn't know what those things meant. I just knew that I was full of spite. So my whole career isn't based on equity, diversity, or inclusion. It's based on spite. It's people telling me that I can't do something, mm -hmm. and me going, well, I'm going to do it anyway. And then that's it. You know, if I if I can't, as much as I have imposter syndrome." There's not a single person out there who can hate on me worse than I hate on myself. So I don't have to listen to those people. I just, I, I come to peace with myself. I come to peace with the people I love and care about. Now, if someone like my mom says to me, yo, you did this wrong, right? Or this isn't proper, then we got a problem, you know? But but everybody else, you know, they can just go kick rocks and we'll be fine. Um. Okay, we have... Only a couple of minutes left, so I and we have one question from um, the audience. I want to make sure we asked it um, for the panelists. Do you have a go-to writing book that you, which you might recommend to writers? Something that still continues to help you even now. Um, I can lead off answering that question by saying no, I don't, which may be sacrilege, but um, I'm I'm learning as I go. Um, the thing I do most probably is go back to the works that inspired me. Um, and to, to, to become a writer, you know, so like my favorite comic book writers, my favorite, you know, novelists, you know, my favorite uh, uh, filmmakers, I go back to those things. Um, but in terms of like an actual like on story or save the cat or any of that stuff, like I, I don't do that. I see David, we're of the same mind, you're shaking your head. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I teach, uh, you know, I teach writing. And so there's some books that are sort of that are on our reading list as as dictated by the university on that but um you know it, it's the only thing that's going to get you writing is 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 you yourself right yeah. and and this this understanding that it ain't going to be perfect the first draft if if you shouldn't even be thinking about it being done until you're well into your fifth or sixth draft right you're never going to learn how to write by reading how to write now you will learn how to write by reading, period. But you just gotta write, you just gotta do it. You know, Read your favorite author, read every single book they've written, read the books that influence them, and then you're gonna learn how to be a writer. That's how we do it. Um, for me, there is one book, The War of Art by uh, Stephen yeah, okay. Pressfield. About I, I how to him. think. <laughs> It's like it's more of resistance and how to think uh, as a writer and, and a bunch of other cool things that certainly had a profound effect on me. Um, it's not like uh, Save the Cat or Robert McKee's storybook or any of those. But um, for me, it's all the process of thinking and getting past resistance and procrastination and um, mm -hmm. being more of a professional at, at, the, at the gig and the task at hand. So that's one I'd recommend. I, I'm going back to, I changed my answer to what Rodney just said. <laughs> <laughs> Yuchide, what about you? Because you were working two whole ass jobs and, <laughs> and, and writing the screenplay. So what, what helped get you through? Well, but that's, I'm so glad you all said that too, because I was sitting here going, wow, okay, um, what's the book? And it's funny that you said War of Art as well, which I think in general artists, um, that that's something that we can all, benefit from um so but you all know i'm an avid reader uh you all know i'm one of the biggest geeks out there 
Um, so it's, you know, stuff that I've been reading since I can think back, since I was six years old and reading like Asimov and then finding, you know, Octavia Butler and going, my mind is blown. And more recently people like, you know, Nettie Okorafor and all of that. Um, and so I just read and read and read. And on top of it, you know, as an actor, you're also reading scripts all the time. You're, you're reading a lot of scripts. And so it's interesting, you start, you start to get a, a certain feel from, from that as well. And there's certain scripts that you pick up and you go, that's incredible. I've got to, you know, I've got to make a note of how, you know, how she did this or how mm -hmm. he did that. Um, so I'm learning from everything I'm picking up um and everything that i'm watching so I, I mean what gets me through like you know to work and do old jobs and then writing that thing is it's again because i love the storytelling i love the story and so I, i'm always trying to immerse myself in it in whichever way that i can um but no i do not have a specific textbook for that but art of war yes rodney absolutely <laughs> um Okay, I think we are at about you, time. You, you missed me, Evan. Sebastian. You got it. You got it. You got to go. Yeah, yeah. You take take us out. About, I've been writing out like twenty books that I recommend just to really prolong this. Uh, <laughs> Hold it up to the screen. Hold it up to the screen. Um, no, for me, uh, I'll just flip it and say, for me, uh, there's a poem I always come back to that my old man. Uh, it kind of gets me through the procrastination and gives me courage when I'm feeling blue. And it's if everyone knows it, you know the Kipling poem. And I think sometimes like that, that does me good or uh, Keats or some some poetry that gives me the courage of my own convictions now and again. And if I'm feeling a little like, oh, I'm the shit. Actually, this is kind of shit. I need now and again, someone smarter or more eloquent to remind me that I'm doing OK. And the last thing I'll say is my go to is not to, to help inspire my writing and my writing choices is music and mm -hmm. the frequency of spirit that when I'm writing everything I write has a soundtrack and a certain type of sound and frequency that I have to, before I even put pen to paper, get within that space. So if anything, I would say, if I was being really obnoxious and whatever, I'd say Alice Coltrane, that's my go-to. So if you, the Alice Coltrane is the- Which album, which album? Journey, Journey and Sachi Dananda. It's the, always the move for me. So. Man, I, I, I'll say that, uh through an intense, really emotional period earlier this year, I was bumping um, uh, Farrell Sanders' Karma uh, oh, yeah. appeared as a master plan. Um, I put it on my rec when I had my record label, I used to release all that music. So that's how I discovered that music when I was a kid. So Pharaoh, Alice, to Bob James and that kind of sound. So that's another side of my, my upbringing, but yes, that's my go-to. Um, all right, guys. We are at time. Um, I want to thank um, my fellow panelists for taking the time out in different time zones to be with us. Um, I want to thank Thaddeus for uh, moderating the first part of this until technical difficulties uh, took us away. And I want to thank VirtuousCon for putting on an awesome Juneteenth event and having us all out here. And I want to thank everybody who's watched um, um, or will watch this stream. We appreciate you. And please support the creators on, on this panel. Um, um, watch their shows, get their books, myself included. Um, and uh, you can find us all on Twitter and various social media platforms. Be nice if you reach out to us there. Um, and thanks again to VirtuousCon. Take care, that. everybody. Thanks, guys. Take it easy. Yeah. Here we are. Here we are. <laughs>